something interesting. Um, we have a website, and the links to their sermons are on the website, and you used to get five or six views. I have no way of knowing who they are. But recently, there's been 20 views. Sometimes 19, 20. The last one was 21 views. And I don't know why that is. I, don't, <laughs> I have no idea. Somebody's passing the links around, you know, or something, I guess. I don't know. I would expect some views for this sermon today because of how many aren't here today. So, anyway, I, I was going to have a three-part sermon, uh, three-part uh, series, which I did the first two. Then I preached a different one. Uh, and now this is the third in that series, and the title is A Wicked Woman. The doctor and the lawyer were talking at a party and their conversation was constantly interrupted by people describing their ailments. Coming over to the doctor, what should I do? They're looking for free medical advice. And after an hour of that going on, the exasperated doctor asked the lawyer, what, would, what do you do to stop people from asking you? for legal advice when you're not in the office. He says, I give him the advice, then I send him a bill. So the doctor was shocked, but he thought, I'll give this a try. The next day, the doctor prepared the bills for the people that were coming up and asking him for free medical advice. When he went to place them in the mailbox, he found a bill from the lawyer who gave him that advice. So first we talked about Elijah and how God used him to defeat the prophets of Baal. And they were evil people, by the way. Then last week we talked about how Elijah ran away from the threat of Jezebel. And God told him to go back the way he came. He was to anoint Yehu, as king over Israel. I think that's how you pronounce that, Yehu. And God told him to anoint Hazel as king over Aram. We pick it up in 1 Kings 16, 29 to 33. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel. And he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which, by the way, was that Jeroboam led the northern ten tribes away and led them into idolatry. He created two golden calves. He said, these are your gods, O Israel, who led you out of Egypt. That was the sins of of Nebat, they started worshiping golden calves. But he married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we ask your blessings on this word as it goes forth, Lord. We cannot ever improve on your word. We just share it, Lord. So we pray that you will guide and direct this word right in to hearts uh, where it needs to go, whether they be watching it online later on or whether they hear it here lord we just pray for victory to come through your word in jesus name amen so that uh, scripture was the first mention of jezebel in the old testament first time we heard about her she was the daughter of the king of the sidonians therefore she was a sidonian princess sidon was on the northeast coast of the Mediterranean. They were a people known for their idolatrous practices 
that Jezebel brought with her to Israel. And these practices would create many problems for the nation in the coming 22 years of Ahab's reign. So their marriage, we've noted that Jezebel's marriage to Ahab was the first introduction uh, to her life in the Bible. Jezebel brought her religion to the marriage. She was a worshiper of the idol Baal and the other idol Asherah. Ahab gave in to her wishes and promoted the religion in Israel. They weren't supposed to do any of that stuff. Deuteronomy 7, 3 to 6 says, do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in the fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all people on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Two thoughts about that. You are a people holy to the Lord. That means separate. That means not part of the world. That means God's people. You are holy to the Lord. That's, that implies separation. And the other thing, your God has chosen you. He, they were chosen to be um, the race of people from whom Jesus, his physical nature, his physical body would come. And so he was to descend from the line of David. Together, Ahab and Jezebel made life difficult for those who wished to follow Yahweh, Jehovah God, made it difficult for them. Both of them, not only Jezebel, pulled people away from Yahweh, Ahab's choice of, Be of Jezebel was disastrous for him and for many other lives. We have to learn that the person we decide to marry might bring their faith or lack of faith to the union, to the marriage. It's important that we decide to marry someone who will be faithful to God. We're to seek God's kingdom in our lives. Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek his kingdom first. The person we marry will have a position of great influence over our lives. I'm probably preaching this to the choir, but maybe someone will hear this, you know, that, that it will affect them sometime. The spouse will have an input on matters related to our money, our children, our activities, and our worship. It is the great place of influence that a person might have in another person's life. That influence can be either good or it can be for bad, depending on what kind of person that we marry. I've seen, I've seen marriages that ended in tragedy, not as a pastor. I, I remember when I was a photographer in a studio, this was in Worcester, Massachusetts, people had they got married, they ordered, they came in and viewed the proofs and ordered the wedding album, and they never picked it up because they got divorced before the album was prepared. They got divorced before they even got the pictures ready. So it sat on the shelf forever. 
I remember photographing a young couple one time. This was in, in, in Worcester, Massachusetts as well, I think. Man, that's a long time ago I'm remembering, but I photographed her bridal portrait before the wedding, and then I photographed the two of them together for an engagement picture. On the wedding night, I saw in the paper he was arrested for assaulting someone, and he assaulted the bride. Needless to say, that what marriage didn't stay together. But we would do well to marry a faithful Christian believer. Some people think, well, I'll, you know, I'll influence the person after, you know, and, and they'll convert to my way. Maybe not. In 1 Kings 21, um, 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 25 to 26 says, there, there was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. He behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols like the Amorites that the Lord drove out before Israel. So then Jezebel she sought to systematically destroy God's prophets to the point that they had to go into hiding to escape persecution because she was having them killed. Talk about an evil person. She also sought the life of Elijah as well, 1 Kings 19. Moreover, she gave refuge and safe haven to the priests and priestesses of Baal and Asherah. There were 850 total. And Elijah's words in 1 Kings 18 said, Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. These were evil people. I don't know why they were called prophets, but they were leaders in worshiping idols, in worshiping Baal, which involved infant sacrifice, and Asherah, which involved ritual perversion. Jesus' words came to mind, come to mind from Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Blessed are you, when men shall reproach you and persecute you. We learn that wherever there are competing religious ideologies, God's people will more often than not be strongly persecuted. Happened in Rome, happened all over the place. Jezebel played a leading role in the acquisition of Naboth's vineyard. Naboth's vineyard was on a plot of ground that he inherited, and it was next to the palace of, of, of Ahab. And Ahab wanted that vineyard for his vegetable garden. And uh, Naboth refused to sell it because it was his inheritance, and the Lord said for them not to let their inheritances go out of their particular clan. But that didn't stop Jezebel. She sent letters to the city's leaders urging them to frame Naboth for blasphemy and have him stoned, and that's what they did. Then she told her husband Naboth, uh, uh, Naboth uh, that Naboth was dead and urged him to take possession of the vineyard. She coveted to the point of murder. Covetousness is a terrible sin. Exodus 20, 17, thou shalt not covet. Covetous was listed as one of the reasons to, withdraw, to withdraw fellowship by Paul. In 1 Corinthians 5, 10, Paul tells us that it's simply another form of idolatry when we allow the desires of this world's possessions 
to take control of our lives, then there is no end to the evil that we would be willing to do. Such is the result of covetousness. Hebrews 13, 5 says, let your conversation be without covetousness. So God had enough of that and he promised death of Jezebel. Jezebel had done such wickedness to God's people in her life that God prophesied for her a terrible death. 1 Kings 21 and 23. And also concerning Jezebel, the Lord says, dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. That prophecy was reiterated in 2 Kings 9 when Yehu was anointed king over Israel. And verse 1 says, The prophet Elisha summoned a man from the company of the prophets and said to him, Now this is not Elijah, this is Elisha, who God said to anoint as, his, as Elijah's successor. And then Elijah was taken up in a fiery chariot into heaven, and Elisha carried on the ministry of Elijah. And he, and he said, Summon a man from the company of prophets, and said to him, Tuck your cloak into your belt, take this flask of olive oil with you, and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you get there, look for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshai. Go to him, get him away from his companions, and take him into an inner room. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and declare, this is what the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and run. Don't delay. So the young prophet went to Ramoth Gilead. When he arrived, he found the army officers sitting together. I have a message for you, commander, he said. For which one of us? Asked Yehu. For you, commander, he replied. Yehu got up and went into the house. Then the prophet poured the oil on Yehu's head and declared, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I anoint you king over the Lord's people, Israel. You are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master, and I will avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the Lord's shed, uh, servants shed by Jezebel. The whole house of Ahab will perish. I will cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, son of Ahijah. As for Israel, as for Jezebel, dogs will devour her on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and no one will bury her. Then he opened the door and ran. That was what God instructed him to say through Elisha. Yehu then began carrying out God's orders to kill all of Ahab's progeny as Elijah, as Elisha had prophesied would be done. That was Elijah prophesied in 1 Kings 21. When Yehu finally came to Jezebel's house in 2 Kings chapter 9, then Yehu went to Jezreel. When Jezebel heard about it, now she was a widow at this point for quite a few years because Ahab was already gone. She put on eye makeup, arranged her hair, and looked out of a window. Strange, because she knew they were coming after her. So she fixes her eyes up and gets all prettied up and looks out of a window. As Yehu entered the gate, he, she asked, Have you come in peace, you Simri, you murderer of your master? In other words, he was the one who killed her husband, Ahab. He looked up at the window and called out, Who's on my side? Who? Two or three eunuchs looked down at him. Throw her down, Yehu said. So they threw her down, and some of her blood spattered the wall and the horses as they trampled her underfoot. Yehu went in and ate and drank. 
So he went in and had a sandwich or something. I didn't have sandwiches back then. But he went in and had lunch while the horses were finished trampling on her. And, and he said, take care of that cursed woman and bury her, for she was the king's daughter. But when they went out to bury her, they found nothing except her skull, her feet, and her hands. They went back and told Yehu, who said, This is the word of the Lord that he spoke through his servant Elijah, the Tishbite, on the plot of ground that Jezreel dogs will devour Jezebel's flesh. Jezebel's body will be like dung on the ground in the plot at Jezreel, so that no one will be able to say, this is Jezebel. Now Jezreel is where the palace was and the plot next to it was no doubt Naboth's vineyard. And she had him murdered so Ahab could have his vineyard for a vegetable garden. And I think that was the plot of ground that Jezebel's body would be like dung on the ground in the plot at Jezreel. After he had lunch, he came back to bury the body, but the dogs had come and feasted on her corpse. There was nothing left but her skull, hands and feet. That was the promised death that God had prophesied for her. God takes seriously the persecutions placed upon his people. Matthew 18 talks about God's displeasure toward those who would cause his people to stumble. So much so that Jesus said it's better that a millstone be wrapped around someone's neck and they be cast into the sea instead of causing one of God's people to stumble. In the life of Jezebel, we see an Old Testament example of just what God does to such people. Sin is offensive to God and God will reward sinners according to their evil works. Jezebel was a wicked woman who did many things and, and she reaped what she sowed. Galatians uh, chapter 7 or chapter um, 6 and verse 7, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. I think in the King, King James it says there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Jezebel was brought up in a culture of evil. Religion is mostly evil. Let me say that again. Religion is mostly evil. Religion is man trying to control God. Even some of the Christian faiths is about man trying to do those things which will cause God to bless them. It's man trying to control God. We don't call this a religion. We call it a relationship with God. And he controls us. Amen. Jezebel probably thought that because her dad was the king, and because she was a princess, whatever they were doing was normal. Murder and perversion was their normal. She didn't think too much about it. Whatever you want, just take it, like Naboth's vineyard. She was murdering, killing off the prophets of God. We live in a culture of evil. Murder and perversion is normal. Our schools and the media portray murder and perversion as normal. When I say murder, I'm talking about abortion. They don't portray other murder as normal. 
The Ten Commandments had to be removed from public places because they might influence people. Morally, this country is upside down. This culture is upside down, even in churches. Judgment is coming. Amen? Judgment is coming. Revelation chapter 2, beginning with verse 18, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Verse 21, I have given her time to repent of her immorality but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of their ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. There is a Jezebel spirit leading people astray. It never stopped. She makes every effort to drive a wedge between believers and God. She appeals to itching ears, 2 Timothy 4, 3, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. You don't have to look too far in the world today and in this country to see that happening. She appeals to envy, James 3.16, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. She appeals to doubts, James 1 six to eight but when you ask you must believe and not doubt because no one who doubts because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind that person should not expect to receive anything from the lord such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do she appeals to lust First Peter 2.11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. This is from a commentary I found uh, where it says Jezebel. Some adopt the reading, thy wife Jezebel. From these words, it has been thought that there was some personal influence at work for evil in Thyatira, that's in Revelation. Whether in the household of the angel or not uh, is at least doubtful. The sin alleged against her is the same for which the Nicolaitans are condemned, which is fornic fornication. And the eating of things sacrificed to idols if that view is right, the leader of the exorcist is a woman regarded by her followers as a prophetess, as one with a real message from God, but viewed by the Lord of the churches as a very Jezebel, teaching and seducing the servants of God, for letting her alone, for being timid, paying too much deference to her spiritual pretensions for failing to see and to show that the so-called deep things of these teachers were depths of Satan, the chief minister is rebuked. A large number of respectable critics regard Jezebel 
as a name applied to a faction, not as belonging to an individual. It seems best to view the name as symbolical, always remembering that the Jezebel spirit of proud, self-constituted authority, vaunting the claims of superior holiness or higher knowledge, linked with a disregard of and perhaps a proud contempt for legalism and followed by open immorality has again and again run riot in God's churches. Jezebel was a wicked woman. She was a murderer. She had no regard for human life. She had no respect for private property. Jezebel had influence in high places, evil influence in high places. So here we have a weak-willed man in a high authority in the nation, in the highest place of authority in that nation. And we have an evil, influential woman from outside of the Hebrew culture. Ahab married her for influence with her father, Ethbaal, Jezebel exerted way more influence than God would tolerate. She imported evil idolatry. Baal worshiping, baby killing, perversion, Asherah worship. She brought their evil worship leaders and she supported them. They ate at her table. The result was a disaster for everyone involved. Ahab was killed, all of Ahab's sons were killed, and Jezebel was killed in the most gruesome way, and there wasn't enough left to her to make a grave. The Jezebel spirit always tries to drive a wedge in between the one true God's worshipers and those who go the way of the world. God's way is not the way of the world. Jezebel doesn't have to be a woman. A man or woman can have a Jezebel spirit about them. A movement can have a Jezebel spirit. How can you know the Jezebel spirit will not promote the gospel? The Jezebel spirit will not promote the gospel. It will not honor Jesus as Lord. We know that God's word, we know what God's word says. We know what his will is. Read the book. Live the word. Anything else, anything that causes unscriptural division in a church can be a Jezebel spirit. Jezebel's body was destroyed, trampled by horses, devoured by dogs. But the Jezebel spirit is still alive. I'm not talking about her spirit. I'm talking about the Jezebel spirit, causing as much trouble as possible. You can see that in churches. Not, not the churches like us, but churches that, the churches in which the salvation is by the church, not by Jesus, in which the church itself is more important than Jesus or God. Guard your heart. You know, we have to be vigilant. I remember, this is more than 20 years ago, And a woman started coming to church down in Altoona there. And, uh, and she was acting like a super Pentecostal woman and all that. And she started gathering people around her. It was a faction. And she wanted them to call her Mama Vicky. She was looking for a title. Mama Vicky. And she was gathering these people. It was a faction. It was a division. We have a very wise pastor, and he got rid of her. But people 
who aren't grounded in the word and living the word, they look for signs and wonders and they, oh, she's a wonderful person and she's a prophet and all this stuff. But she wasn't. She wasn't. Those are dangerous people to the church. Amen. So we have to guard our hearts. We have to be vigilant. I'm very fortunate we've never had any problems like that in this church. But I've seen those problems. I've seen them. Would you stand? Ah, I love this church. <laughs> I love the people in this church. Even the ones that aren't here. Even the ones that aren't here. And I pray for all of you at least twice a day. Yep. If I wake at night, if I wake up at night at 3 30 in the morning, I just start praying for you guys. <laughs> Everyone, by name, every single one of you. And you guys included. And Mark and Sherry, the other other couple that started coming, and Nancy. Nancy, by the way, will be back at the end of this month. She was gonna come back in August, but she said she's probably gonna be here at the end of this month. She sent me a whole bunch of pictures. And she isn't in any of them. They're just scenes. There's a, there's a video of some uh, fireworks going off over the ocean. And, and there's all these different scenes, mountains and stuff, you know. I wanted pictures of her with that stuff in the background. <laughs> but uh, then she sent a picture of her son crabbing. They call it crabbing. He had a fishing pole and he was on a dock. And they caught some crabs, but she had she got a reaction and her face swelled up but anyway she'll be back with us and uh, that's a wonderful thing so Lord we do thank you that we don't have a Jezebel spirit in this house we pray that one never comes here but we will be vigilant we'll guard our hearts and we'll be careful Lord that we don't get anyone who tries to influence us away from God into other things and we ask that you be with us all very personally until we meet again in Jesus name amen okay